first time I heard uh, Gottberg speak, he was talking about uh, matrix completions, which uh, Steve and I really enjoyed and did some later work on. But uh, the, the thing about uh, Gottberg's talks is he was always uh, equally excited about the uh, beautiful mathematics he was creating uh, and about its uh, applications to, uh, in, th in that case, to, to engineering problems. So I, I hope uh, today's talk is, uh, is a bit in Gottberg's spirit. Uh, I wanna talk about these cooperative games which uh, arose in computer science, but have now had a, an immense impact in questions in mathematical physics and uh, just recently uh, solved a longstanding problem in operator algebras, uh, the Kahn embedding uh, problem. Uh, through the theory of uh, cooperative games. So uh, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, let me uh, start. Uh, really, uh, in a sense, uh, these cooperative games, we're going to be playing them with quantum dice. So I thought I would uh, start off with two sort of famous quotes. Uh, Einstein, who originally when was confronted with quantum mechanics, uh, said, uh, God does not play dice with the universe. And Stephen Hawking, who had very much the uh, opposite view, not only does God play dice, but he sometimes throws them where they cannot be seen. And I think it's this uh, second view that's really uh, more uh, appropriate for, for today's talk. So uh, both of them were talking about this phenomenon in quantum mechanics called entanglement, which is still something we don't understand very well. Uh, Einstein at first thought it could be explained away with his uh, theory of uh, local hidden variables. We'll see how that plays a, a role in the background here. Uh, but now we know that this phenomena just can't be explained away. That really is a, a strange new phenomena about the uh, universe. Uh, and it's, uh, it really violates a lot of our common sense intuition. And we'll see how, it's, uh, how that happens uh, when we play games. Uh, if we uh, allow players to have quantum dice, then uh, lots of our intuition about how games should behave is, uh, is overrun. So the kind of games we'll look at are, are cooperative games. And uh, we, we now know that there are several possible mathematical models for describing the kinds of probabilities that come out of uh, quantum physics. And uh, Quantum co cooperative games has really been the uh, most uh, successful way to uh, separate these different mathematical models. But uh, unfortunately, the, the games so far use uh, impractically large numbers of inputs. When you start to talk about your number of inputs as being the same as the number of atoms in the universe, then it's not a very uh, useful game for experiments. Uh, typically, the uh, the most recent game seems to have around maybe at least a billion, uh, billion uh, inputs needed. But so all of this leaves us with this mathematical problem of trying to find simpler games or, or other types of tasks that could potentially help us determine which of these uh, many mathematical models for describing uh, entanglements are really the one that's uh, most appropriate. And that's a place where I think uh, mathematicians can really, really help out. So let me, uh, let me show you a, a little cartoon picture of what uh, these cooperative games look like. So they involve three people, uh, a referee and uh, Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob are the two people who are cooperating. They're, they're not competing against each other. They're trying to uh, cooperate to win a game. So the way a, a round goes is the referee will feed a, a question to Alice and question to Bob, or just an input if you'd like to think, and they'll uh, reply with their outputs. Now, Alice and Bob can't talk to each other. So Alice doesn't know what Bob got. Uh, Bob doesn't know what uh, Alice got. And their goal is to return an AB pair so that uh, the X, Y, A, B is a winning tuple. So, so the catch here is that to be a winning tuple really depends on all four things, but Alice has to return a, an A without knowing what Y and B is, and Bob has to return a B without knowing what X and A is, and yet they wanna to try to win somehow. So as I say, the tricky bit is Alice doesn't know the Y and Bob doesn't know the B. So let me start with a, 
a very uh, simple and famous example to uh, illustrate these ideas best. I think it's uh, examples are the best way rather than talking more about uh, the abstraction. This is known as the CHSH game. It's named for Clauser, Holt, uh, Shimini, and Horn. And in this case, uh, the inputs are just uh, elements of the binary field. So Alice and Bob can each get one of two possible inputs. And their outputs are also elements of the binary field. And the uh, rule is that they'll win if the outputs that they return add up to be equal to the uh, product of the inputs mod two. So if Alice gets a zero, she knows the product is gonna be zero, but she doesn't know what Bob's gonna give uh, for his answer. So she doesn't really know whether to return an odd or an even uh, number. Well, suppose that though that they also know that of the four possible input pairs, uh, the referee is going to uh, give them to them uh, randomly with uh, equal probability of uh, one quarter. Now it makes sense to ask, uh, what's the uh, best strategy? What's the, uh, what should they do to try to uh, maximize the probability that they win? And I think most people can see that uh, out of these four pairs, only the pair one, one will give a product X, Y that's equal one. So three quarters of the time, uh, the X times Y is gonna be zero. So, so they wanna aim to have their A plus B be equal to zero as often as possible. And so one thing they could do is just agree ahead of time that they'll always both return uh, a zero no matter what they get. And in that case, they'll win three quarters of the time. And if you, uh, so that, that strategy has a, a winning probability or what we call the, the value of that strategy is uh, three quarters. And if you uh, think about it, uh, that's really the best you can imagine doing. Uh, but when you think about that, what you're really thinking about is deterministic strategies. That's uh, deterministic means that the output that uh, each player returns is really a function of the input that they received. And among all deterministic strategies, you can just go through them. There aren't that many functions. And this is the best function. Uh, it's also the highest winning probability uh, that can happen with uh, something called uh, local shared randomness. And I'm not going to try to define that right now, but uh, we'll, we'll see what that means a, a little bit later in the talk. So what would, uh, what would a quantum strategy amount to? Well, again, I have the, the same cartoon, but uh, imagine that there's a pair of laser beams, uh, one coming into Alice's lab and one coming into Bob's lab. So now uh, Alice could perform experiments on these uh, laser beams and get uh, outputs that way. And Bob could perform experiments. So uh, as I said, suppose we've got these two laser beams streaming in. Uh, so their strategy this time is uh, to decide what are the experiments that they're going to perform. So they'll each have two experiments uh, labeled by zero and one. If they get a zero or one, that's the experiment they perform, and they want their experiments to have two outcomes, uh, again, labeled zero, one. They run their experiment, they get an answer, and that's, uh, that's what they return to the uh, referee, depending on the uh, sort of random uh, value that the experiment gave them. As we all know, in quantum mechanics, uh, things tend to behave uh, randomly outcomes. Well, if the laser beams are not entangled, then again, the best they can do is still three quarters. But if you allow this uh, magical, mystical entanglement uh, and you choose just the right experiments to perform, then uh, you can increase the winning probability up to, uh, uh, well, cosine squared of pi over eight, which is about uh, 0.85. So you can win 10% more often uh, by having these laser beams, then you could win uh, using any kind of uh, common sense uh, probabilities. So 
So, so just to emphasize here, these, these beams don't know anything about the questions. They're just a fixed pair of beams that are coming in uh, unvarying uh, uh, no matter what the questions are. And uh, the other thing is that this is not just uh, abstract theory. There are already beam splitters uh, commercially available that produce pairs of laser beams that are entangled in the way that's uh, needed for this higher probability. The entangled state, for those of you who know some things, is, uh, is what's called the Bell state. That's a very famous state in mathematical physics. And so uh, physicists uh, have put together uh, laser beams that can uh, produce uh, Bell states very, very regularly. So, uh, so the thing is, uh, you better be careful when gambling with quantum players. Uh, what you think is common sense and what you think is optimal is not really what's optimal if, uh, if quantum mechanics is allowed uh, in the background. Uh, more importantly, I think going forward is uh, there are many transactions in the real world that have uh, values assigned to them using uh, game theory. But uh, all those calculations uh, assume classical randomness. So I think uh, going forward, we're going to have to uh, start rethinking a, a lot of things uh, in terms of what are the values, uh, the true values when you allow quantum. But again, the true value when you allow like quantum depends on these uh, various different models of uh, quantum mechanics. And we no longer know which is the right model. So uh, roughly the reason these higher probabilities occur is because when beams are entangled and uh, Alice performs uh, experiment X and gets outcome A, then uh, what entanglement tells us is that that can subtly change the probability that uh, Bob uh, will get outcome B when he performs experiment X, uh, experiment Y and, and vice versa. So there's some sort of uh, subtle correlations that go on between the outcomes in these uh, quantum uh, experiments. This subtle effect uh, happens no matter how far apart the two labs are, which was the thing that really bothered Einstein. He called this a uh, spooky action at a distance. They feel that somehow it was uh, violating uh, some of the other principles of physics. And uh, he, he built this uh, theory of local hidden variables to try to uh, explain what, uh, what entanglement uh, was. But, uh, but we now know that uh, local hidden variables can't explain these probability densities. And uh, that, uh, there are many densities we can get uh, with quantum experiments that are outside uh, his theory. So let me now explain a little bit more carefully what these uh, two kinds of uh, probability densities are. So the, uh, the first one is, uh, so, well, in, in each case, we're gonna assume they each have uh, a lab and in that lab, they've got uh, N experiments. I'll always label them by X and Y. And uh, we'll, let's say each experiment has uh, K possible outcomes. Uh, sometimes you have uh, N1 experiments and N2 and K1 and K2, I'm gonna just simplify. And then I'll let uh, P, A, B given X, Y denote this uh, conditional probability density that they get outcomes A and B given that they performed uh, experiments X and Y. So if I, uh, a good way to think of this P, A, B, X, Y, I can package it as uh, a point in the uh, uh, N squared, K squared products of the uh, closed unit interval zero, one. Since their probability densities, uh, they all lie between zero and one. Uh, the local hidden variable model turns out to uh, imply really that there's some unknown probability space that really represents the hidden variables and that conducting an experiment is really evaluating random variables over this space. So uh, if you let uh, F sub X and G sub Y be these uh, random variables uh, on this underlying space that represents uh, the experiments X and Y, uh, then you see uh, in this uh, local hidden variable model, the only kind of uh, conditional probability density you can get is it's just the probability of the set of omegas so that 
f sub x is a and g sub y is b. So all the possible probability densities I can obtain that way is I vary the probability space and the uh, random variables. Uh, that gives me a set of these uh, densities. And so that gives me some subset of 0, 1, n squared, k squared. And that's what I'll call the local probability densities uh, labeled by n and k. So uh, what do these quantum ones look like? Well, the standard, the uh, usual model for describing these is, uh, goes as follows. So uh, it, each uh, lab has a, a Hilbert space that represents the state space of that lab. And uh, for each experiment, there's something called a projection valued measure. So if, uh, if I have a, an experiment X and an outcome A, there'll be a projection EXA. Uh, for each experiment, these projections have to sum up to the identity in each lab. Uh, and uh, the way these work is if you were just purely inside one lab and you had Alice's lab was in some state psi A, uh, so that uh, represents the uh, state she's going to be measuring, then the probability that if she does experiment X that she gets outcome A is given by the projection applied to that vector in a product. And uh, similarly for Bob. If, uh, if the joint state was just psi A tensor psi B, then this uh, joint density would just be uh, this P, A, B, X, Y. Uh, when you do this tensor product applied to a tensor product, it just does the uh, product of the two numbers. And uh, that, uh, you can prove, is always something that belongs to uh, a local density. So if the states are, this is what's called a separable state. So if the states are separable, densities are always uh, local. Uh, what entangled uh, refers to is just uh, any unit vector that's uh, not of the form uh, an elementary tensor. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, the probability densities you get are, can't, uh, can't be replicated by the local model generally. And, uh, the C sub Q densities uh, stands for all the densities you could get uh, doing that as you range over all possible finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, all possible sets of projections and all possible unit vectors. And so that's the set uh, CQ. And this is the usual model that physicists use when they talk about these uh, probability densities or when they talk about what they call quantum correlations. The CHSH game, uh, the fact that you get uh, different uh, probabilities of outcomes means it's really a witness uh, to the fact that these uh, two sets of uh, densities uh, aren't the same. So what are these uh, other models for quantum densities? Well, the first one is uh, a priori, there's no reason that this uh, set CQ of uh, density should be a closed subset. So uh, the closure is uh, called the quantum approximate densities, just its closure inside uh, zero one. So things you can approximately get with a quantum. Uh, there's one other model that we'll be uh, interested in and that's called the quantum commuting densities. And this is a different model of math physics. So it says that uh, uh, sort of the viewpoint behind it is instead of each lab having its own individual state space, well, the universe is just some big uh, state space. And uh, Alice and Bob, when they perform experiments, they're acting uh, on the universe. And so their uh, measurement operators should add up to be the identity on that Hilbert space. And then the fact that their labs are separate and uh, not communicating, that should be that uh, the order in which you do these actions uh, doesn't matter. So Alice's operators commute with Bob's. Uh, Alice's don't have to commute among themselves, but they must commute with Bob's. And Bob's must commute with Alice's. And so in this model, the universe is in some state psi and the probability density you get is uh, just the EXA times FYB psi psi. 
And uh, the set of uh, all those densities is uh, denoted by C, Q, C, and K. So uh, originally uh, it was conjectured that CQ and CQA and CQC were all the uh, same sets of uh, densities. But uh, now we know that in fact, uh, they're all different. So the fact these uh, first two are different, that goes back to uh, Bell and Bell's inequalities. Uh, William Slofstra was the first person to show that uh, the, the CQ set was not equal to its closure. And he did that uh, with a quantum, uh, a, qu a cooperative game of the kind we're going to talk about. And then most recently and remarkably, uh, these uh, last two sets were shown not to be equal. But, uh, but the point is all these separations, the first proofs uh, used uh, cooperative games as the way to see them. And we hadn't been able to see them any other way except by uh, building games. So somehow games were the right language for seeing these separations. The, the work of uh, many, many mathematicians, including uh, Younga and Ozawa, uh, proved that uh, Kahn's embedding conjecture uh, was uh, equivalent to these two sets being equal. So that's why lots of people in operator algebras got uh, interested in it. Uh, and this, uh, the proof of this last inequality was due to G, Natarajan, Vidic, uh, Wright, and Yuan. Uh, it's a very long paper posted on the archive in uh, January of 2020. Uh, it's, uh, it's over, it's around 200 pages. Uh, so there's still a lot, of, uh, a lot of work being done trying to digest it and, uh, uh, well, check that uh, everything in it is correct. Uh, but uh, it seems to be. And uh, so uh, because it shows uh, Kahn's embedding as false. Uh, it uh, means that there are many conjectures in operator algebras that we now know have uh, negative answers. So there's a great deal of work in operator algebras that has to be done uh, unraveling all this and its meanings. Uh, the proof of the existence of this game though, it's, uh, it's mostly implicit and the uh, the number of inputs you need, uh, you can only sort of estimate uh, sort of the best you can do at each stage. And it gives an N, which is very, very large on, on the order of uh, a billion. So that's not very practical for doing in a lab. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we now know uh, these other two sets can be separated at quite a small level. You only need five inputs and two outputs uh, to separate those sets. Those of you who listened to uh, Magdalena Musat's talk, she, uh, she gave a rather lovely uh, simplification of uh, what we did originally. So now uh, let me come back to uh, these games and uh, talk a little bit about the formal definition and uh, what's, uh, what's really going on there. So, so to specify a game, we really need the input sets for Alice and Bob, the output sets, uh, uh, v, which is the verification uh, equation, and uh, pi. So the i's and the a's are the input sets, the o's are the outputs. Uh, this v is what really represents the rules. And it really is just a zero one function where uh, when something is equal to one, that means that a, b is a winning response to the input pair x, y. And when it's zero, that means it's a losing response. And then if you want to talk about the probability of winning the game, well, you really need a, a prior distribution on the input pairs. So when Alice and Bob are designing a strategy, uh, they uh, really need all this information. And so formally, that's what we mean. Uh, Alice and Bob know uh, this set, uh, G, and now they're going to try uh, their goal is to try to produce an allowable density that uh, makes their probability of winning as large as possible. But of course, by uh, allowable will mean uh, the density belongs to one of these four different sets, either the local correlations, the quantum, et cetera. And as we saw informally in this CHSH game, uh, this probability of winning uh, 
really can be larger if you allow quantum resources. Uh, most of my work is uh, centered around what are called perfect strategies for games. So let me uh, explain that. So if we're given a density, it's called a perfect strategy for the game if the probability that it produces a losing answer is zero. So any, in other words, any time uh, V of something is zero, then the probability of uh, getting outcome A, B, given input X, Y is zero. So if you have a perfect strategy, then no matter what the uh, density pi is on inputs, your probability of winning would always be one. And so no matter how many rounds of the game you played, you'd always give correct answers to the referee. And uh, what's, uh, what's remarkable and uh, really fascinating is that there are many games that have perfect quantum strategies, but uh, no perfect uh, classical strategies. So in a sense, uh, things that you can't, uh, can't win, uh, you can, there's, a, there's kind of sort of a quantum notion of uh, winning the game. And so my research really focused on finding uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for games to have perfect strategies in uh, each of these different models. So the, the kinds of games uh, that have really been interesting uh, to me especially are the uh, K-coloring games for graphs. So uh, there are also games for deciding if a graph has clicks of size K or independent sets. Uh, there are games for deciding if uh, graphs are isomorphic. And there are games for solving uh, systems of equations uh, over finite fields. So let me just, uh, uh, each of these games is what uh, computer scientists call a, a prover system in the sense that uh, there exists a perfect density uh, classical uh, if and only if the corresponding problem has an actual solution. So let me uh, describe this uh, K-coloring game for graphs just to give you a flavor. So here you have a graph with a vertex set and an edge set. The, the game is the, uh, the inputs are the uh, vertices and the outputs are the colors. And uh, the referee will give Alice and Bob a pair of vertices, and they have to respond with a pair of colors. Now, in order to win, uh, anytime the vertices were adjacent, they had to reply with uh, different colors. And anytime the referee gave them both the same vertex, they better both reply with the same color. Now you can prove that there's a, a classical probability density that wins that game with probability one, if and only if the graph actually has a K coloring. But for many, many graphs, there are quantum uh, uh, perfect strategies with a, far few, with a K that's far smaller than the coloring number. The uh, game for solving systems of equations is uh, you have uh, some finite system of equations. And what the referee does is he chooses an equation to give to Alice and an equation to give to Bob. And then uh, what they return is values for the variables in their equation. And to win, they each have to return a set of variables that actually solves their equation. And uh, also, if there was a variable that was common to both equations, they have to return the same value. Now, uh, you can prove that uh, that game, if you play it, uh, so, so even though you're only looking at a pair of equations at any given time, and there could be uh, many, many equations, uh, if you can win this game uh, locally with uh, classical probability densities, that you can prove that can happen if and only if the system of equations has a, a simultaneous solution. But then again, uh, there are many, many times when systems of equations with no simultaneous solutions have uh, perfect uh, quantum strategies for winning. And then since uh, Boolean logic can be described in terms of systems of equations, this means that uh, there's sort of a new notion of uh, quantum Boolean logic. Uh, 
and that's uh, that's where the uh, computer scientists really became involved in this. So the uh, one uh, example I, I like to do of this uh, quantum one is a thing called the, the real Hadamard graph. So the Hadamard graph uh, omega sub n, the uh, vertices are, are all n tuples of plus and minus ones. And you consider two tuples to be adjacent if their dot product is zero. In other words, if they're orthogonal. So the, the ordinary chromatic number of these, uh, there's no formula known for the uh, exact value, but there are some bounds. It's known to be uh, larger than 1.06 to the n. On the other hand, there's a, a perfect quantum strategy for n coloring these graphs. So we sometimes call that the quantum chromatic number of the graph. And uh, this shows that it can be exponentially smaller than the classical chromatic number. The, Ivan Todorov and I extended this a little bit by looking at, uh, instead of just uh, looking at the complex version. So instead of Hadamard uh, graphs, we looked at uh, the case where the uh, tuples were tuples of complex numbers of modulus one uh, with uh, tuples being adjacent if, they're if their inner product is zero. Uh, so if they're perpendiculars, vectors, uh, points on the, the N torus. And uh, there, uh, it was the mathematics coming from the discrete Fourier transform uh, that allowed us to prove that all of those graphs uh, are also only n colorable. Uh, these last kinds of graphs I've been talking about, so these last kinds of games, uh, belong to a family of games that's uh, known as synchronous. And this is really the kind of the best family of games for which we have a really nice uh, clean theory. So uh, the game is called synchronous if the, uh, if the input sets for Alice and Bob are the same. So the question sets, so like the graph coloring, uh, the input sets were vertices for both of them and the output sets were colors for both of them. And the rule should always include this requirement that if Alice and Bob receive the same input, then they must give the same output. So in a sense, these uh, games are, are mimicking the idea that uh, Alice and Bob must be using something like a function and they must both be using something like uh, uh, the same function. And so uh, just in terms of the, uh, the rule function, it means that VXXAB is zero uh, for all X and for all A not equal to B. So uh, that's all a synchronous game is, is one with, uh, whose rule function has this extra constraint. So we say that a, a set of uh, projections uh, in a C star algebra, notice this time I only have one set, not a set for Alice and Bob, just uh, Alice's if you like. Uh, we say they satisfy the fundamental orthogonality relations for this game if, uh, well, first off, they're projection valued measures. And uh, second off, uh, anytime the rules are zero, then the corresponding projections are orthogonal. And uh, here's why synchronous games are uh, important. Uh, theorem I'm about, about to state uh, was there's, uh, there's an earlier version done by uh, Severini, Stalky, Ivan Todorov, Andreas Winter, and myself for the graph coloring game, which is one example of a synchronous game. And uh, well, I'll, I'll explain a little more the connections of that to uh, this. So the first thing is you can prove that a game has a perfect strategy uh, of the classical kind, if and only if you can find projections in an abelian set of C star algebra that satisfy those orthogonality relations. Finding a, a quantum one is if and only if their projections in the matrix algebra satisfying uh, those. So uh, the lovely thing here is that this means that instead of having to seek out these specific probability densities, you're just having to ask orthogonality questions. And you've turned it all into, uh, can you cleverly construct uh, projections uh, with uh, these properties? So uh, these two equivalences for uh, uh, graph coloring games were known in this earlier work. 
and also this CQC uh, was known in the earlier work. So having this perfect uh, quantum commuting is the same as you can choose projections in a C star algebra with a trace uh, that satisfies this. So, uh, uh, well, and then the paper with uh, Sam Kim and uh, Schaffhauser, we proved that the uh, having a perfect strategy in this uh, closure of CQ is exactly the same as having projections. Uh, I'm not gonna go into what this is. Those of you who know what it is, know what it is. Uh, for everybody else, it would take too long to explain, uh, but there's a special von Neumann algebra called an ultra power of the unique hyperfinite two one factor that uh, has a trace on it. And uh, you can find projections in there if and only if you have a perfect uh, strategy in, in CQA. So that was, uh, that was the piece added by uh, Sam Kim, Chris Schaffhauser and myself. And then sort of tying it all together and stating it this way is uh, in this paper with the, these three guys. So the earlier work, uh, we had everything except the CQA, uh, but we only stated it for uh, graph coloring games. So, so this is really lovely because for each of the strategies, you no longer have to look at densities, but it relates, uh, relates things to uh, these uh, satisfying these orthogonality relations. Uh, there's sort of a fifth thing you could ask. You could ask, can I do these orthogonality relations on a Hilbert space at all? And uh, that's, uh, you could sort of add that on as a, a fifth thing here. So the uh, sort of a, a most original version of uh, Kahn's embedding problem, it uh, asks if uh, every C star algebra with a trace uh, can be embedded uh, inside this uh, special C star algebra. If this asks a sort of a universal model for all C star algebras with a trace. And uh, what uh, this uh, remarkable paper did was it actually produced a synchronous game that had a perfect QC strategy, but no perfect QA strategy. So that means if you write down the fundamental orthogonality relations for that synchronous game, uh, they can be satisfied in some C star algebra with a trace, but they can't be satisfied in this C star algebra. So uh, there's no way that the C star algebra here can be embedded inside this one. So it gives a, a very concrete way of seeing that, uh, well, if you could write down the game concretely, so you knew exactly what these orthogonality relations were concretely, it would give a very, very concrete obstruction to uh, con being true. And uh, so, uh, so that's where these uh, theories come together and, and kind of a, a lovely way, I think. And it, uh, it shows that uh, not only is con night the, the embedding problem have a, a negative answer, but, uh, but there's just some finite collection of projections and orthogonality relations that can exist in a tracial C star algebra, but you can't build them inside R omega. It's a very finite obstruction in that way. But of course, the problem is the game is very, very implicit. So we can't just write down this list and maybe the list is just really as long as a, a billion relations. Well, so for the, uh, the last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, now that we know these uh, three different models really give different sets of probability densities, uh, the issue becomes uh, which one is the, the most correct for physics and uh, is there some way we can find uh, uh, maybe a more reasonable game or maybe some other kind of task that's uh, down on a more uh, reasonable scale and uh, that can distinguish the, them? Uh, so the hope is that eventually if we have something simple enough, then that's something a physicist could turn an eye to and try to determine uh, which of these models is really the, the correct model for physics. Uh, my, my betting is that, that it's really this QC model that's uh, correct, that the uh, tensor products are, are really an artifice. But, uh, but so that's, uh, that's the last thing I wanna talk about. And uh, the other work 
have done is uh, is on sort of looking for uh, some such task or some such model. And uh, one task is, uh, I'll just state it loosely here, it's a catalytic production of entanglement. And so let me explain uh, what I mean by that. So suppose we start with these uh, individual state spaces in Alice and Bob's lab, and they each have a state in their lab. And, uh, but then we also have uh, this vector that I'm gonna call the catalytic vector. And it lives in some other Hilbert space, which I'll call the, uh, refer to just loosely as the common resource space. Now, the goal of this is you'd like to build some entangled vector in their lab out of these two uh, separable vectors. And the way you're going to do it is you get to start with the uh, separable vectors uh, along with this uh, catalytic uh, vector, which you're going to use. And uh, then Alice and Bob get to act in uh, uh, some sort of non-communicating fashion. This is what I won't really have time to explain today, but, uh, but the idea is they act uh, independently on their vector and the uh, piece of this uh, vector that protrudes into their lab. So if you imagine this vector is given by, you know, these uh, pairs of laser beams, then Alice in her lab could do something on her state psi A and use this uh, laser beam that's coming in, but it's really entangled with this laser beam that's coming into Bob's lab. And so Alice does her operation in her lab, Bob does his operation in his lab, and at the end of the day, what you'd like to get is you'd like to get this uh, target entangled vector living in their two labs. But at the same time, you would like to not destroy this catalytic vector. So now, uh, now since you haven't destroyed this, you now have this lovely entangled vector that you can use to do things with. And after you're all done, you can... Uh, go back to this and use this vector all over again to uh, start with your pair of unentangled and produce, uh, produce entangled. So can you do that? Well, we weren't the person, people who thought this up. This was uh, Hayden and Van Dam. And they uh, showed that uh, in this uh, tensor model uh, with finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, this task can be done to within epsilon for all epsilon, but not exactly. And what I mean by uh, within uh, epsilon is that uh, after you've uh, produced this entangled vector, this won't be exactly psi r anymore, but it will be a vector that's within epsilon of psi r. Uh, and you can, by making the dimensions of all the state spaces arbitrarily large, you can make that uh, epsilon as small as possible. Uh, they referred to this as uh, embezzlement because uh, you can fool a physicist into thinking that he's really done something catalytically because uh, his, uh, his measurement systems aren't gonna be able to see things arbitrarily well. And so whatever his epsilon is, you can now, uh, do this within a smaller epsilon and uh, fool him into thinking that you've catalytically produced uh, entanglement. So it, at the time, the belief was that uh, because of this, if you just allowed uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces in the tensor model, you could do this exactly. But uh, in joint work with uh, Richard Cleave, who's a computer scientist, and uh, Li Lu, who's in uh, math physics, uh, we showed that uh, in this uh, tensor product model, even when you allow infinite dimensional spaces, uh, you still can't do this exactly. So it's a very funny thing. You, uh, you can do it within epsilon in finite dimensions, but as you let the dimensions go to infinity, you can't make the epsilon go away. Uh, this uh, thing where you allow infinite dimensional spaces, but you're still using this tensor product model of physics, that's called the uh, tensor model. So within the tensor model of physics, uh, this, this is an impossible task to do exactly, but, uh, but it's uh, 
impossible to not sell because you can do it to within epsilon for every epsilon. Uh, but then the other thing we showed is in this, uh, what does happen in this limit is you've really passed to the quantum commuting model. And so this is something that can be done exactly in the quantum com commuting model. So if there was some way that uh, I, the other day, uh, uh, Ken Dykema uh, referred to something, uh, something as being uh, an operator as being in nature. So if, uh, if in nature you somehow discovered uh, that uh, entanglement was happening catalytically, then you'd, uh, then you'd know that uh, nature was really built on the QC model. But as I said, that's, it's very difficult to tell, uh, to tell because since it can do it to within epsilon for all epsilon. So uh, with, with Benoit Collins, we were able to uh, improve this a bit. And we did the sort of old, uh, you know, hair of the barber question, who, who cuts the barber's hair, who cuts the hair of all barbers. And we ask ourselves the question of, uh, well, in this uh, finite dimensional problem, what if, uh, what if you'd like to build a machine that uh, catalytically produced a catalytic vector? Right? That, that would be a great machine because uh, once you have a machine that has this catalytic vector for producing uh, entanglement, now you'd like a new machine that uh, catalytically produced the catalytic vectors and you could send them off to all your friends and then they'd have catalytic vectors. Uh, and we showed that uh, when you do this, so, uh, so what I mean here is one fixes some entangled vector uh, and we'd like to uh, catalytically produce it uh, using phi. So in other words, the catalytic vector that we'd, the entangled vector that we'd like to produce is the same as the catalytic vector in that uh, earlier model. And what we proved is that uh, there's a uniform bound so that uh, in finite dimensions, you cannot do this to within, uh, once, you're, once you're handed this particular vector, there's, uh, there's some delta and you can't do this within delta, no matter how large the finite dimensional space is. So, so this makes it very hard to, to take the limit because you're always uh, bounded away from doing it uh, in finite dimensions. But again, we proved that, uh, yeah, so more precisely, there, the bounds uh, only depend on the vector you're trying to catal catalytically produce. Uh, and it's independent of the uh, dimensions of, uh, of anything. But again, this can be done uh, exactly in this uh, quantum commuting model. So we, we hoped that this might be the sort of task that uh, is sort of uh, simpler, but, uh, but there, there are some problems with it, a little too difficult to uh, explain here. But, uh, but hopefully these last couple of slides indicate what I mean by, uh, by other tasks, so, something uh, that uh, with a, a bit of uh, new imagination, we can come up with uh, something that's uh, more, more simple that sees the uh, differences between these models. And I really think that this is the kind of thing that uh, mathematicians and operator algebraists have uh, a much, uh, where we could really make a serious contribution to, uh, to sorting out uh, which of these models is really the, the real model of, for physics. Well, that's, uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, here's a, a list of uh, references. If you get interested in these things and like to start doing them, I, I don't expect you to absorb the whole uh, list uh, right now, but uh, hopefully these slides will be up somewhere and uh, you can come back and uh, refer to these. And here are some references on this idea of uh, uh, catalytic production, which is often called uh, embezzlement. Uh, I got very uncomfortable one time when I was traveling to a conference overseas and I had a uh, my uh, briefcase was filled with uh, papers on state embezzlement. And I, I was really hoping the uh, border security people were not going to look in there and ask me what uh, that was all about. So I really prefer to call it uh, uh, catalytic production of entanglement uh, instead. 
Well, uh, thank you, and uh, I, I hope you uh, enjoyed the talk, uh, and I hope I lived up to uh, Gothberg's uh, standards. That's, that's all for now.